Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Today, we're going to relearn about the Gibson Widow series. So first off, what exactly does a Gibson Widow mean? Widow refers to this. The binding has been painted over the same color as the guitar. So as you can see here, this thing has orange binding, but it's not actually orange. It's just a finish over top of it. In fact, if you were to scrape that off, you would just still find the white binding underneath it. You can see evidence of that on the neck. Just the edges of the binding has been sprayed orange, but the top of it is still that regular creamed color. And these are mainly guitars for people who love a certain color to death. They want it everywhere on their guitar. And these Widows used to really confuse me because you would see all kinds of different specs, all kinds of different colors. So I've developed this guide to help you understand the Gibson Widow series. And if you're interested in checking out other Widow colors, I do have many other videos. The reason why we're talking about them again today is because I got two new ones, one orange and one that has a little bit of a secret to it. So let's go ahead and talk about these. The Widow series was actually born as a Sam Ash exclusive called the Black Widow. Now, despite being called the Black Widow, it wasn't actually black. It was like the Black Widow spider. It actually had a spider decal on the back of the headstock with a red stinger. And that birthed not only the Widow series, but also Animal Influenced Les Pauls, which are some of my favorite ones. And the original Black Widows actually had R7 historic gold top specs. That's what it was billed as on the COA, an R7. So that means you had things like the ABR1 bridge, the long neck tenon, single ply binding on the front, no binding on the back, but yet it still had a Les Paul custom neck on it. So you had the ebony fretboard with mother of pearl block inlays with the custom emblem on the headstock. But kind of a curious spec about those is they were also chambered. But then flash forward two and a half to three years later, in 2012, Gibson finally released their own lineup of Widow guitars. This is the first time that you see multiple colors introduced. It's no longer just the Red Widow with the red colored binding. They introduced orange, green, red, purple, and blue. Now, in my opinion, orange and green are the coolest ones because what is most unique about this lineup is they have the rosewood fretboard because 2012 is that first year where ebony was kind of a hard thing for Gibson to come by due to government raids. So if you ever see one of these with a rosewood board, you know it's from the original first series and they made anywhere between 15 to 35 of each color. But something to know about these is these are officially custom shop Les Paul customs. These are no longer R7s, so that means you have multi-ply binding on the front and the back, which gives it a very striking look on the edges. But at the same time, you lost the historic features, so you no longer have the long neck tenon, you no longer have the ABR1 bridge. It is now down to the Nashville style and short neck tenons. And most of these were flame tops. I believe you can find some quilty ones, but most of them are billed as Les Paul Custom Fs. These runs eventually sold out and it was a proof of concept that there are people willing to buy a single color guitar like this from the custom shop. So anything made from 2013 till early 2019 is what I consider a third generation widow. It's the exact same thing as generation two, except for they use rich light frat boards. Now rich light is not inherently bad, but a lot of traditionalists hate it, but that's the only spec that's changed between these, except for they now have added more colors. You can custom order any color you want. They also introduced satin finishes on these guys. And you were able to order these in new body styles like the flying V and a few other ones. And a fourth generation widow is anything made 2020 and beyond. The difference for those is you'll actually have a real ebony fretboard, just like the original Black Widow. But what if I told you there was actually a prototype stage in 2010? That's what this guy is right here. I've already documented a different purple widow, but I wanted to document this one again because this is actually a prototype 2010, made slightly after the Black Widow when they were actually trying out all these new colors. But you're gonna notice this one actually has Black Widow specs. It's got the same chambered body. You can see this will have historic specs because it has the ABR1 bridge. So that means it's going to have the long neck tenon most likely too. It doesn't have the Schaller tuners of the original Black Widow, but you can kind of see all these specs coming together. So this prototype Widow was a really great find. I can't wait to throw it on the workbench to show you guys a little bit more about it but this very well could have been the first Purple Widow ever made in existence. But what's kind of strange is instead of being billed as an R7 on the Certificate of Authenticity, it's billed as a 68 reissue quilt top, which I kind of find funny, but it's such a dark purple color. It's really hard to see that quilt top, but it is there and it is absolutely beautiful. 
but you can see this one has the single ply binding on the front. So why they called it a 68 reissue, I have no idea because it doesn't really have 68 reissue specs but this one is serial number 16. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they made 16 of these. It doesn't necessarily mean they made 16 colored widows. That's just the production sequence for that particular year. So this was very early made in 2010. So that means the prototypes pretty much fall within Gen 1, but it's just kind of cool to see a Gen 1 and a Gen 2 side by side so you can see the differences between their bridge, their neck tenons. And hey, it's just cool to see purple and orange together, right? So let's go ahead, throw these guys on the workbench and take an individual look at their parts and specs. Take a quick look inside this orange widow. So verifying everything that I said before was true. You've got the 490R, 498T pickups in here. And inside here, we will see our short neck tenon because we don't see any joint in there. But it's kind of cool to see that orange finish within here. Not quite as cool as the blue one in my opinion. Because that blue review and demo, the maple top on the side looks really cool inside the cavities. Whereas orange, it just kind of looks similar to what we would normally see. But our bridge on here, it is the Nashville style. It has the PW markings on it. And the tailpiece is full weight. But this has to be the nicest top that I've seen on any Widow. Like in photos, this does absolutely nothing for me because I'm not a big fan of the pinstripey stuff, but this one is so active. I mean, take a look at it on my GoPro camera. You can see what you see in person. That is just fantastic. But this one just has four speed knobs. It would be cool if they would have colored those as well and maybe even the truss rod cover over here. But unfortunately, no. But nobody has ever installed a pick guard on this example. And we've got pretty typical readings. 7.54 in the neck. This should be about 14-ish. Yeah, 13.69. These two together, 4.85. Two-piece maple top, mahogany body, likely nine hole weight relief since this is a custom shop custom. And once again, rosewood fretboard, 22 medium jumbo frets, 12 inch radius. This one's looking pretty nice here. Face of the headstock in all its orange glory. You can see our truss rods in good shape too. As far as neck specs here, we get a 1.68 inch nut width, which increases to 2.06 by the 12th. First fret neck depth, 0.83 and 0.97 by the 12th. One thing that did catch my eye about this guitar is if you get it in the light just right, you can see there's a semicircle impression right here. What that is, is the results of the Bigsby Vibramate. So those Vibramate things, they advertise you don't have to drill anything on your guitar, it will not damage it. That's false. Those little felt pads do damage the finish. Now you might be able to French polish those out or something, add a little bit of lacquer, but at least the other one sleeps underneath the tailpiece. It's not a huge eyesore or anything, but it is there. Moving on to the back, not too much to go over here. It's just a black back. Once again, you can see that orange colored binding on the back here. That really looks good. It's like a super age 70s Les Paul or 50s Les Paul custom. But inside here, you have the Gibson branded pots. Everything appears to be factory in here. And here's our three-way toggle switch. And the only other interesting thing is the toggle switch plate. They have this Gibson custom. It's like a uh, sticker, actually. You could take that off if you wanted to. In 2014, they introduced those medallions. But do take a second to note, thin binding in the cutaway. But the neck, nothing too special here. It says Gibson Custom with the decal. I found it interesting that there's like a little ding impression right here. Likely somebody was leaning this up against something, but it almost looks like Arabic writing or something. And the serial number on this one dates it to 2012. This one weighs eight pounds, 15.4 ounces. So right at nine pounds, that's pretty good for a Les Paul Custom. Let's go ahead and check out the prototype widow. Just as a recap, that was a Gen 2. This is essentially a Gen 1. Really pay attention to these differences. It might not seem like a lot, but it is huge. These are completely different guitars. So first off, our pickups in here are actually 57 classics. But here we can see that historic long neck tenon. It's that little chunk of wood right there. Doesn't necessarily make the guitar better or worse. That's up for you to decide. Uh, personally, it's just a historic thing. Anything that's you know historically correct to a 59 is going to make the guitar more desirable. That's the same thing that we're talking about here with the bridge as well. Those posts are drilled directly into the top instead of in a stud. So in theory, it transfers vibrations better to the body. That's why people like the ABR ones. In a technical sense, the Nashville style bridges are superior, but due to historical accuracy, people like the ABR ones better. 
they also face the opposite direction. <laughs> but our bridge pickup, also 57 Classic, nothing too crazy going on here. But you can't see your two-piece quilty maple top on this one. The finish is rather dark, so it's kind of hard to see through to it, but it is there and it is a beautiful sight. Something else that's historic, you're going to see you have little thumb bleeders right here on your speed knobs. And again, no pick guard on this one, but you can see uh, somebody slightly chipped the finish right there so you can see through to the white binding. Another small feature that may or may not be stock is the ambered switch tip. And the tailpiece itself is lightweight aluminum. A lot of people feel that these things give you better tone. But if nothing else, they make your guitar lighter. Now the mahogany body on this one's chambered. We'll see that on the back side. But the neck, it's mahogany just like that last one. And we have a true ebony fretboard, 22 medium jumbo frets, 12 inch radius, all the good stuff. But I actually bought this one before, you know, 2020 came along and they introduced ebony back into the lineup. So pre-gen 4. So when I bought this, this was actually even more special. Because the fact that we have a colored widow with a true ebony fretboard, that's huge. So this is like more so a collector's piece, even more more so than the 2012s and other limited runs of the Purple Widows. So if you're going to own a Purple Widow in your collection, it might as well be this one. But at the same time, remember, this only has single ply binding around it. So if you like that multi-ply look on both the top and the back, you might go for one of the later made ones with rich light or a brand new one. The nut on this one, 1.67 inches. Looks like 2.06, but I'm guessing our widths are going to be different. First fret neck depth, 0.88. And then by the 12th, 0.97. That's strange. The Orange Widow has more of like a thin neck profile to it, whereas this guy feels much more rounded. It's interesting. You'll also notice that this one has a blank truss rod cover. It does not say Les Paul Custom. That's something else that kind of tells you it's in the prototype stages, but a very cool Gibson Custom headstock with the purple over top of it. And you can see, once again, the multiply binding on the headstock. Moving on to the back here, this is where things get interesting. I couldn't get this back plate off, and we don't really see anything in the toggle switch cavity anyways. This is what everybody's here to see. So you'll notice that the pots are actually different. They're not the Gibson branded style. And it's not just because they switched over to the Gibson branded pots a couple of years later. This is actually a short shaft historic style pot. You see how the body actually routes down right there? That's how they get away with using the short shafts. And as promised, it is completely chambered out right here. So that makes this example incredibly lightweight. There's many different ways that Gibson chambers these guitars. This is one of my favorite ways. There's not actually even a center block in the middle there. They just have a little bit of an extra hump right here for your strap button. But that then continues all around here until we eventually get up there. So if you drop something in there, you can get it out over here. So that's pretty cool to find another one specked out like that in a widowed finish, just like the original Black Widow. Back here, it's just a black neck, same Gibson Custom Shop logo, same Grover tuners as we saw on Gen 2, and here's our serial number, 16. Once again, I want to emphasize, that's just the 16th guitar made in 2010 in the Custom Shop. So there's not really a way to know how many of these original prototype pre-production widows were made. Or who knows, maybe there's just a custom order, but I swear I remember seeing at least one more of these when I was doing my initial research back when I bought this, probably, what, eight months ago or so? So just kind of a cool piece of transitional Gibson history. With the chambering, this one's about a pound lighter, 7 pounds, 15.4 ounces. So let's go ahead and plug these guys in and hear how they sound. <laughs> Thank you. 
troglodytes. I hope you enjoyed taking a look at these widows with me today. Are they for everyone? Definitely not, but if you love a certain color, they are meant for you. But it was definitely a real treat finding this prototype widow. Now, please do keep in mind, it's not marked prototype, so it's technically not one, but this is like a pre-production widow, definitely. Now, the big question, which version did I prefer? Honestly, I've never really lusted after an orange widow, but now that I've had one, these things look fantastic in person. Maybe it's because Halloween's coming up and these are very Halloween colors that I fell in love with this one. But as far as the way that they played and sounded, despite the purple one being about a pound lighter, I think I preferred playing the orange one. However, when it came to the distorted tones, I preferred the purple widow. But you gotta remember, purple had 57 classics whereas the orange one had the 490R, 498T. So it's not all just down to the way that the guitar was built. It also comes down to the electronics that's in them. All in all, both fantastic guitars, but if I had to choose just one rarity aside, I would probably go with the orange widow. Let's check these things out under blacklight real quick. Starting with our purple widow, it's kind of interesting. There's like these orange glowing marks. I'm not sure if that was touched up or you can also see a small chip in the paint right there in the binding. And here we see that glowing part again, but everything along the edges is looking pretty good. This one was definitely played. As far as whatever this is, it just looks like maybe something was in the case and it was laying on it for a long time. Maybe there was a sticker on here. I can't really make out what it is. Yeah, here we're seeing some stand rash. Thankfully, that's a black finish. That's why we can't see this stuff in regular lighting. You can also see some stand marks right here. So definitely a good thing that this was not a natural finish because this thing has been on display somewhere. As far as our orange widow here, this one's glowing a little bit more as what I would expect. It's got a little bit of aging to it, but nothing too extreme. No funny glowing bits on this one, but I like how you can actually really see that orange even through the black light. Looks like maybe a little bit of stand marks on the bottom. Even some on the neck. <laughs> but no brakes, cracks, or repairs, and that's what we're really looking for here. As far as the case goes on this one, the earlier ones got the Gibson Custom Shop cases, the later made ones get the lift and reissues. So this is the prototype Widow case. It's got some dust on it, it's got some storage wear, and all latches are present and functioning. And it's got that crushed red velvet interior. Oh, that's a nice view of this one. The lighting's just right so you can actually see that wood figuring. And it's got a double neck rest, and inside here sleeps a whole bunch of case candy. I mean, this thing literally has just about everything including our COA here, which once again bills it as a 68 custom Q for some reason. And you even have your warranty pamphlet. Troglodytes, thank you for tuning in today and learning about the Widow series with me. If you're interested in being the next owner of the Purple Custom Q Widow, this pre-production run guitar will be for sale on my Reverb page. I'll leave a link in the description. The Orange Widow was a new Guitar Day forwarding service. It is not available, so no, you cannot buy it. Sorry. Thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.